Hey, it's me. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be here with you and in, to introduce you to a man who knows that life is a learning experience. Jerome Garfunkel, sometimes called Jerry, also known as Dr. Cobol to some for his contributions to a computer programming language, common business-oriented language. Jerome Garfunkel is also an educator, calligrapher, lecturer, and technologist. So how are you, Mr. Garfunkel? Uh, I'm fine. A little chilly today. It's uh, one degree right here in Woodstock, New York this morning. What is Woodstock, New York like? Interesting question. It has leftover remnants of its old reputation of being the hippie town. It's a quaint, small town. There are kids that come from all over the country to play guitar on the center green, it being a tradition of Woodstock. But of course, it's much more than that. Woodstock has a reputation of, besides music, it's a large center for uh, Buddhist monasteries. There's a few of them here. And it's also a very popular art community. So it attracts quite a few different people from different realms. Hmm. I think most stories are best from the beginning. So tell us a little bit about your early life, where you're from, kind of a snapshot of what life was like from your early days. Certainly. I grew up in Queens, Kew Garden Hills, Queens, New York. Interestingly, I always look back now as an adult and realize I grew up in a very vanilla environment. Nothing terribly radical about where I grew up. I was in a primarily a Jewish neighborhood. In fact, I remember thinking to myself, the first time I left New York City, I hitchhiked across the country at 18 years old. And it was the first time I realized the whole rest of the world was not Jewish and the whole rest of the world was not white. It was a, it was an awakening for me. My family was a wonderful, loving family, supportive. There was not much trauma in my family. And therefore, I grew up thinking that the rest of the world was like that. And of course, I learned in real life, the rest of the world was not like that. So I became grateful for the upbringing that I had. I had parents who were very supportive of uh, their three boys. Education was a, an important part of the values they wanted to teach us, and education is what their three boys got, a very good education. And that's what life was like in Queens, New York. I went from kindergarten to a bachelor's degree, all within walking distance of the house that I was born in. It made me realize later on why my I had this wanderlust to, to explore the country, to explore the world. I was kind of sheltered for most of my growing up years until I, I realized there was much more to see outside of Queens, New York. Now, you mentioned education being very important to your parents. Where do you think that came from? I, I have an interesting theory, and perhaps it's not a new interesting theory. I think the Jewish value system in Jewish families that may have come from Europe uh, and settled into America, those values filtered down to my generation. My brothers and I were the first in our family to go to college. So it didn't come from my parents' own experiences in college. It came from my parents' own experiences of not going to college and being frustrated by that and recognizing the value of education. And to this day, education for me is an important value that I pass on. Every time I hire an employee for, uh, as a secretary or an assistant and so on, while I pay minimum wage or a little bit better, I always also pay for their education. I always offer them night schools or if they want to continue ed education, I, I offer them that option if they'd like. So that only can come from my value that was passed on from my parents. What did you learn from your parents? I'm sure that's a huge question, but if you could tell us what, what you think has been the greatest application to your life that your parents passed on to you. 
other than this love for education? It's a good question, and you're right. It, it is a huge question, but I can point I can point to a few specific things from my father, who was an analytical mind. He passed on to me and my two brothers analytical skills. Two of us became mathematicians in college. That was my major in math. I went into computers, and and to this day, I have a love of mathematics. Some of my old college friends, we still pass these uh, mathematical puzzles back and forth to each other. So for my father, I think we inherited, or at least certainly I inherited, these this analytical side of me. From my mother, the best I can say I, I inherited from her is sweetness, kindness, love. She was a compassionate, sincere human being, and that passed on to, to me for sure. And not that my father was uncaring or, or in any way um, not empathetic and so on. It was my mother who I, I can remember the sweetness and the kindness that is in me that came from her. The name Garfunkel, you don't meet many people named Garfunkel. Tell us about the background, your ancestry. Well, uh, that happens to have an interesting twist that I'll tell you about in a second. My grandparents were from Europe. Both sets of my grandparents from, were from Europe. And in fact, around the same area, they were all four of my grandparents were Ashkenazi Jews from Eastern Europe from not too far from Odessa and Kiev and Romania and Ukraine. And interestingly, I believe, by the way, they they immigrated to the United States in uh, the late 1800s. I've seen records of the ship manifest, is it called, of the names of the people who came. And I see that some of my grandparents and my very oldest aunts uh, came over in the late 1800s, I think it was 1898. And like many other people who were immigrating to America at that time, they settled in the closest place they could find. So they, they entered at Ellis Island and they settled in Brooklyn, New York. And that's where they raised their own families. That's where my par, my father and my mother grew up in Brooklyn. And then later, Queens, which was considered the suburbs and pretty far out from Brooklyn and from New York City, of course. That's where my parents eventually moved, and that's where I grew up with my my family. What I've just learned, interestingly, from my sweet nephew, who did a, a who was over in Romania not so long ago, and went to the town that we were we came from, Yash, Romania. It's in eastern Romania, and he befriended the mayor, the current mayor of the town. And they began to look up the records of the Garfunkels coming to America. And what we discovered was that we were not Garfunkels. I believe our name was Markov. I may be mispronouncing it or misspelling it, but Markov. And that my grandfather, in order to increase his chances of being accepted into the United States, changed his name from Markov to Garfunkel so that he would have a more German-sounding name, because apparently America was accepting Germans more easily than they were accepting Russians or Ukrainians and so on. I only learned this not so long ago. So that's how we became Garfunkels. Very interesting. My last name, Leslie, was originally Liesel, and it was the same exact thing. (laughs) Trying to avoid, trying to sound more uh, American was what I heard. Very interesting. It uh, confirmed that apparently that was a a trend in those days. So this nephew of yours, what was his reportage to you? What did he tell you about this time he spent in Romania? Well, it was a short trip to Romania. My nephew, James uh, Arthur Jr., has been living for some time in uh, Europe, uh, he lives between Germany at times and and in uh, Siberia at times. I believe he has an apartment there. But he comes to America pretty often. In fact, he's here right now, and I'm trying to meet up with him before he returns back to Europe. 
he was the one who just was exploratory. He was the one who who had the the guts, I would say, to to um, find out more about the Garfunkel family. And this apparently is what he uncovered. Very interesting. I want to get back to this love that you have for technology, this interest in computers. What was it that fascinated you about computers? Well, there's a natural, first of all, there's a natural migration or connection between mathematics and computers. Computer skills are very much about deductive logic. A computer programmer his main skill, his or her main skill, is deductive logic. That's what the art and the skill of computer programming is all about. That, to me, comes right out of mathematical analysis. This is what we learn in geometry. This is what we learn in trigonometry. This is what we learn in algebra. This is all about deductive logic. So there is the connection, first of all, between my interest and my love of mathematics and my going into computers. It was in the late 1960s that the opportunity came about to go into the computer field. I knew nothing about it, but I was fascinated by it. I remember I had a um, a side note, an after school job while I was in college, was working at a bank in New York City in Manhattan. And I worked in the computer department doing some menial jobs. But in the middle of this room, this this data processing room, was a fishbowl room, completely surrounded in glass. And when the door opened to that room, there was a rush of cold, pure, clean air that came out. It, It told you there was something very special about that room. And only certain people were allowed to go into that room. I suppose that's what gave me my initial fascination with uh, computers. What is there about that special place? I want to be there. I want to know more about that. And sure enough, when I left college, and I I left college without taking, I think I took one course in, in computer programming. It was a language called Fortran. I still knew nothing about computers for real. But then an opportunity presented itself just when I finished college. My oldest brother worked for Honeywell Computers. Honeywell in those days, they were in the the Pentax camera business. They were in the thermostat business. And they were also in the computer business. At a suggestion, his suggestion, I went in to take a, a test to be a computer programmer. I wound up very proudly being the first person who got a perfect score on that, that programmer aptitude test. So I was hired on the spot. And in those days, they hired people without background, willing to train the brand new employees. Something that changed later on, but in those days, they were hungry to grow computer programmers. And so I started learning computer programming. In those days, it was a very low level programming. You may have heard the term of machine language or assembler language. This is what I was learning these low-level languages that were connected to the particular brand of computer that you were working on. So I became an assembler programmer for Honeywell. I did very well. I get, get kept getting promoted and, and encouraged to do more. And eventually I went into learning COBOL just as a, as a novice COBOL programmer. And I started doing very well COBOL well enough to begin to teach it to other people in my own company. I kept getting better at teaching COBOL and eventually went into the teaching department of of Honeywell, teaching COBOL. And that's when my life changed forever, actually. I um, fell in love with teaching. I had always been in love with teaching. I earned my, my allowance, if you will, in high school and in college as a math tutor, high school math tutor. Uh, so the, the skill of teaching was already being tested in me. And I found I had a natural instinct for it. I loved it as much as the subject. I loved the, the skill of teaching and figuring out how to teach better, how to improve that. 
So when I went into the Honeywell teaching department, I was now for the first time mixing two big loves of mine, teaching, of course, and computer technology. And I wound up, I shined, and I eventually outgrew uh, Honeywell. And I have a theory. Large corporations don't know how to deal with exceptionally poor employees or exceptionally good employees. They have guidelines that they must follow, you know, in the rule books of employees. They don't know how to deal with people who are outside of those gap guidelines. Well, I clearly did eventually get to be outside those guidelines. I was very good. And the uh, customers of, empl- of Honeywell that I used to be sent to help, my job was to um, help install these computers at Honeywell's customers and help them set up their accounts receivable systems and their payroll systems and the, their banking systems, all of their business systems. That was my charge, my my uh, charge from Honeywell at the time. And at some point, the customers uh, kept asking for me uh, when they would hire Honeywell for their services. And at some point, I began to realize Honeywell is making a lot more money than I am. And they're making that money based on my talent. And it was a, um, a decision I, that I made after some time with a lot of difficulty whether or not to leave Honeywell and start my own business. And I did. And of course, I never looked back after that. And I I had a wonderful career soon after that. How did it feel to go from being someone who was under the control of a big company like that to being the boss yourself? A great question. That was all about the reason I did it and the thrill of that change of doing what I was doing for someone else versus doing what I was doing for myself taught me a very big lesson. First of all, when I left Honeywell, they were about to send me to Europe for some assignments. I love traveling. I had been traveling all over America during my last couple of years at Honeywell, teaching workshops and classes around the country. But I always wanted to travel beyond America. And here Honeywell now was offering me three new assignments. I remember this very well in London, in in Paris, and in Rome. And here came this decision. It was becoming a very uh, propitious time for me to leave Honeywell and start my business. But I kept asking, am I really wanting to leave Honeywell? Here they are about to send me to give me assignments to places I really wanted to go to. So I remember saying to myself, I am not going to start my own business unless I can build in my business my own need to go to London and Paris and Rome. And if I can't, maybe I should think twice about leaving Honeywell. Well, I remember thinking at the time, if I'm going to start my own business, And if I'm going to create my own need to do this traveling, why pick out London, Paris, and Rome? I could now pick out anywhere in the world. And if I can't build a business that lets me do that, I should think twice. Well, with that in mind, I left Honeywell, and I set my sights. The first place was China. This was 1979. The Cultural Revolution was just ending. Mao Zedong had just died the year before. And China was just now opening up, and we were in the midst of of, uh, establishing uh, diplomatic relations with them. So I set my my sights on China, and in fact, within a year from that point, I was, in fact, invited to join a delegation of computer scientists invited to Peking in those days. This is before it was Beijing. It was soon going to change to Beijing, but we were invited to um, come to China and help the universities that were now re-emerging to help them catch up. During Mao's uh, Cultural Revolution, you may remember, it was very anti-intellectualism. And many of these professors and these intellectuals were sent out into the countryside, into the paddy fields, to work a hard labor. And now that the Cultural Revolution had just ended, 
these professors, these brilliant people, were now pouring back into the city, pouring back into the universities they had left, and they were starting up or restarting uh, all of their uh, technology departments and scientific departments, et cetera. Well, these universities and these professors had a lot of catch-up work to do, and they turned to the West, of course, to help them catch up to the technology that they had been missing all that time. And that's how this delegation of computer scientists was invited to China to lecture and to chat, more or less. We weren't lecturing in, in terms of sitting, standing at a podium and giving a lecture to a, a large audience. We were always sitting around in, in comfortable conference environments, in comfortable chairs with pots of tea next to ourselves. And it was that environment that I went to China to, to provide my particular expertise to the Chinese in their attempt to catch up to the modern technology. I remember interestingly when we were at these universities and we visited their, their libraries on the campus, we found Xerox copies of all of our own books that we had published and we had written this American delegation, uh, the Xerox copies of all of those books were in their libraries, as well as Xerox copies of every Scientific American magazine. It was interesting, of course, that they they didn't care about rights in those days, writers' rights. And to this day, as you know, that persists still 40, 50 years later as a, uh, a thorn in the side of our relations between China and America, which is respect for copyrights. But certainly there it was, we saw it firsthand. And since it was, it was our own books and our own writings that were being stolen, if you will, it hit home hard. But in those days we weren't so annoyed. I remember feeling instead more proud that this was how the, the Chinese were uh, catching up to modern technology by reading our books and by inviting us over to uh, lecture lecture them. You said that you love traveling and this experience in China, you had me right there. I was imagining, visualizing all these things you were talking about. The places that you have been, is there a place in particular that you feel like you had the most profound experience? Hmm. That's an interesting question. My first instinct is to say, no, there is no one place that out, that is so outstanding. There are so many places that were outstanding. Certainly that first Chinese visit stayed with me for the rest of my life. The circumstances of being there and the experiences that I had were wonderful. I befriended a man in, on that trip, one of, one of the other members of my delegation, a man, a man named Wes. Clark, who stayed a friend of mine for the rest of my life. He just passed away not so long ago. Wesley was considered, by the way, he received an award in Washington for being an inventor of the first personal computer, a project that he worked on at MIT called the Link Project. And it was the predecessor to all technology that evolved after that, that led to the personal computers that we know today. But Wes and I became close tight friends. I don't know what, if I ever knew anyone more intelligent or with a better sense of humor than Wes. And of course, we got to know each other's families and, uh, and stayed close all of those years. Uh, so China certainly stands out as one of those highlights. But there are so many other places in America as well. I started this traveling by having not seen much of America before that, other than that that summer that I hitchhiked across the country, I didn't get to really see America that much. I only got to see the strip of America that I traveled on going to and coming from the East Coast to the West Coast and back again. But when I began to teach for Honeywell, every week I was in a new city and not necessarily big cities. They were small cities. And I got to love those trips. And in each one of those trips, each week, 
I would usually be teaching a workshop, a three-day or a five-day workshop. And in five days, working with students, maybe 15, 20, 25 students at a time, I got to know those students. You get close. A teacher gets close to the students when you see them day after day after day, even after a few days. So the experiences that I had of visiting these these exotic, I'll call them, places in America, was augmented by the friendships, the long-lasting friendships that I, I formed in each one of these cities. And still to this day, as before, I am friendly and in touch with some of these students because they've left impressions on me. I certainly love the European travels. Uh, I began to go to the Netherlands frequently as a as one of my frequent teaching places or lecturing places. By that time, I was no longer teaching. I was now giving speeches and lectures and so on. And I fell in love with the Netherlands. I fell in love with the Dutch people. My very best friend in life was Dutch. His name is Wim Ebbinghausen. We uh, stayed connected for many, many years. We traveled through Europe together. We stayed close after all these years. So many of my memories My best memories come from the Netherlands and all over the Netherlands, but certainly exploring Paris for the first time and then exploring Paris for the 18th time stayed with me always as a thrill. I never got tired of Paris, London the same way, although I began to explore outside of London more often because I had friends who lived outside of London. So I traveled a lot through um, England and up into Scotland and Wales as as well. And even outside of Paris and France, I took a few motorcycle trips with my then wife and with my brothers at the time. We uh, traveled by motorcycle across Europe. And I have wonderful memories of those motorcycle trips, renting a motorcycle in London, driving down to Southampton and taking a ferry to Cherbourg and, and then traveling through the Normandy Peninsula and and all over France. Those memories, those trips are wonderful. You were inspired to write a poem at one point called Airports Visited. Yes, I, I'm not sure if I told you the premise or what that poem was really about. All my life, being a, a child of the 60s, I was a pot smoker a weed smoker, a marijuana smoker, on and off. I was a social pot smoker. And um, I remember one trip on my way to Maui from uh, having left Queens, New York the day before. We had a, a stop, an interlude in, in in the big island in Hawaii before I caught the, the next leg of that trip to, to Maui. And um, I always remember looking for places hidden places where I could smoke a joint. Forgive me if I'm if I'm saying anything incriminating now, where the, the police um, might come and get me for this admission. But so that's what that poem was about. The poem was about my looking for secret places out of the way where people were it would be private. There was a little thrill of taking the risk of smoking. But that's what that poem was about. <laughs> well, I, I don't think it's incriminating. <laughs> or maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> I hope not now. I hope I pass the, um, the statute of of, limit, of, of uh, limitations. What's the word I'm thinking of? Yeah, statute of limitations. Paul, where am I speaking to you at? Well, I know the number is a, it's a little puzzling because it's a California number, but I'm actually in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, so I don't suppose you're, ha- you're having minus one degree temperatures there today, are you? Not, cl- not quite. We're, it's, it's been pretty cold for, for the Southeast. We've had a f- quite a few days of the teens and, and low twenties, which is pretty rare for Georgia. <laughs> So I've been reading. Tell us about these motorcycle adventures that you've taken. What got you interested in in motorcycles? Good question. I remember my very first motorcycle, so that might be the 
the place to look back to what got me interested in it. When I was in college, in Queens College, I moved into an apartment in Manhattan. And I had inherited a Lambrenna motor scooter. And I'm not sure if you know about motor scooters and motorcycles. Motor scooters have very small wheels. Uh, motorcycles have larger wheels. Motor scooters are the very worst thing you can drive on the Long Island Expressway filled with potholes and, and other things. But um, being either naive or stupid, <laughs> at that age, I used to drive my uh, motor scooter from Manhattan to Queens and, and back again every day. That was my first experience on a two-wheeler, and I loved it. And um, I, I don't think I was ever without a motorcycle since that point. I was must have been 18 or 19 years old. I was never without a motorcycle until uh, this last two years is when I have not been on a motorcycle, but that's about to change. I'm about to buy another motorcycle as soon as the weather turns uh, good again. The motorcycling for me has two phases. One was the communication, uh, the, the um, transportation, just back and forth. It was a great way to commute. But in uh, 19, late 1980s, I bought a large touring motorcycle. It's called the Goldwing. You may be familiar with it. And it's one of these motorcycles that rides like a Cadillac. It has all the amenities. It's smooth. It, it has stereo in the front and in the back. And it has, it, has, it has all the amenities of a very comfortable car. Well, I bought my first large motorcycle. I came home to my wife. I had just been married. And I told her, I didn't tell her I bought the motorcycle. I told her I'm thinking of buying the motorcycle. And when she saw it, she said, oh, please do buy it. I'll polish it every day. Please get it. Well, right then and there, I knew I married the right woman. And within a month from that point on, she and I were on our first trip cross country to the Canadian Rockies. We took a ride from New York to the Canadian Rockies. and It was a 31-day trip. That was glorious. We just loved every moment of it. And when we got home, in fact, back to Long Island, I lived in Manhasset, Long Island at the time. We were home for about two weeks and we got restless. We missed being on the motorcycle. So we got right back on and we took a trip up to Canada, to the Gaspé Peninsula and through New Brunswick and another three weeks of the trip. And it stayed that way forever. All my bikes from that point on were always large touring motorcycles. I've had a, a number of them. I crossed the country quite a few times on large bikes, trips down to um, Florida to see my parents who were living there in uh, Tamarack, Florida at that point. I got married later, year, later on again to a woman who, who lived in Texas. So I did frequently, or we did frequent trips back from Texas to New York. I loved the idea of touring on a motorcycle. It was just a beautiful way to ride. I was wise and intelligent enough to know that I was on an extra dangerous machine, therefore requiring extra caution and sanity when riding. One cannot get into a fight with another, another car who cuts you off. You have to eliminate all that stuff and, and um, resist getting back at people and so on. So I've had a, light, a, a nice, safe career on motorcycles, putting on hundreds of thousands of miles. And that transferred over into Europe. There were quite a few occasions in Europe where I rented a motorcycle. I had my favorite place in Paris to rent a motorcycle. I had another favorite place in London to rent motorcycles. So I did quite a few trips throughout Europe on motorcycles. A couple of those trips were with my brothers. Both of my brothers were motorcycle riders as well. So the three of us would rent motorcycles and we'd go on these brother trips together. Sometimes we would invite someone along with us on the, these brother trips, but we did about five or six trips, the three of us, somewhere in the world, somewhere in America, not always on motorcycles, sometimes in cars, 
but we had these wonderful exotic trips. We usually have a patient's level with each other of about four or five days. You know, it's interesting when you are adults traveling with your brothers, you bring with you all the old silly arguments that you had when you were kids. They just now they're in adult that an adult version of those problems. So you deal with them as adults. But the old annoyances eventually creep in, especially when you're in a car, a cooped up car for three or four days. There's only a certain limit how much you can take of each other. We rarely finished those vacations as a threesome. We started as a threesome, but always we wound up less than a threesome where one of us just decided they had enough and they they left to go off on their own. (laughs) Another one of your passions, and all the listeners out there, they can check this out. Uh, The website has been kind of dormant, but it's jeromegarfunkel.com, and I'm talking about your interest in calligraphy. Yes, I can tell you where that came from. Interesting. It had its starts very distinctly in my mind. I was working at Honeywell at the time. I remember coming into my office one day, and as I was passing the receptionist, I looked down, and on her desk, she had... she was writing practice eyes, the letter I, and she was practicing because she had been taking a night school class in calligraphy. Well, to see a whole page of collective eyes, about 40 of them on a page, it attracted me. It had a very nice appearance, just as the, the shape of this letter, one after another after another. It was that that caught my interest in learning what she was doing. So on my own, I began to, I began to practice calligraphy. I didn't, I didn't take any books out yet. No, I never took any close courses in calligraphy, but I know that was a starting point for me to learn using a special calligraphy nib, a pen that has a, a chiseled edge nib at the end. One can write beautiful letters if one knows what the strokes are and how to connect the strokes. And if one is determined to write perfectly, that's the idea of calligraphy, really, is to perfect each stroke that you do. And the more perfect each stroke is done, and each stroke connects to the next stroke, the overall look of the letters that you write and the words that you write and the sentences that you write, they begin to look beautiful. And from there, I just practiced and practiced and practiced. It became my form of doodling. Whenever I was bored anywhere, at my committee meetings, I think I mentioned that I I was a member of many different computer committees. And at these committee meetings, I'd sit around a table for a week. There'd be lots of discussion, but some of that discussion can go into my ears while my hand is still practicing calligraphy. So mixed in with all of my technical notes at these committee meetings and whenever I was at panels and and sitting on a panel in, in the interim time, I'd be practicing. Mixed in with all of my, my technical notes were these calligraphy pages that I had played with. And after the years of doing this, I began to look back and I see I have a lot of very pretty note paper that I had been doing. And that's where my love for calligraphy came. And it has never stopped since. To this day, I always have a um, a notebook, a calligraphy notebook by my side. I have about 80 pens uh, on my desk almost always to be choosing from. And I practice. I practice and I practice and I practice. And uh, these practice pages wind up looking nice, but really all they are are practice pages. And uh, that's where my love for calligraphy came. After, by the way, my own calligraphy and my own liking to do my own calligraphy, I became fascinated in the history of calligraphy. Not the history, but all forms of calligraphy. So in my library are beautiful books of Chinese calligraphy and English calligraphy, books of hours, 
illuminated illuminated manuscripts, just books that are that have been celebrating calligraphy for a long time that of course I learned to appreciate. We're joined by Jerome Garfunkel. Are you a music fan yourself? Yes, I'm a big music fan, not a big music performer. Like many other people, of course, I sing in the shower and I sing to myself at times. Um, but no, I'm not a public performer. What kind of music do you most enjoy? I'd say probably classical music is my favorite. Some time ago, when I grew up in my house in Queens, my father was a lover of classical music, and one piece in particular, Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto in D. So I used to hear that a lot growing up. Well, when I became an adult, and I too was loving classical music, and loving that particular piece, as you might imagine, having heard it so many times, I went on a learning journey. I was anxious to learn, and a beautiful piece of of um, symphonic music, how much does the soloist contribute? How much does the orchestra contribute? And how much does the conductor contribute to a good piece of music? So I went on a, on a mission over the years, and I, I purchased and listened to about 80 different versions of Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto in D. Each time I differed either the conductor, the soloist, or the orchestra, trying to learn if I can discern the differences between, I can't say good and bad uh, performances, but certainly great and not so great performances. And uh, along the way, I got to um, love even more violin, uh, Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto, I have spent many hours while nobody was watching, conducting a full orchestra, and I know this piece very well. And I love that I did, in fact, begin to discern uh, good, good soloists from not, not so good soloists. I hate saying that not so good soloists because some of these not so good soloists were people like Isaac Stern and uh, Yosha Heifetz and, and others. But I did finally latch on to my, my two favorite, which, by the way, turns out to be Isaac Hitchcock Perlman playing on the Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto with the Zubin Mehta and the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra. Turned out to be my very favorite, which was kind of strange because it was a live performance and generally live performances of any kind of music, rock and roll, jazz classical live performances are not generally as good as studio performances but this particular one with Perlman and the uh, Israeli orchestra turned out to be my very favorite again going back to the website jeromegarfunkel.com one of the things that really piqued my interest and in was part of the inspiration behind doing this interview was the NPR essay that you did, Living a Long Life. And I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about that and kind of your outlook on, I guess you could say, a person's later years in life. Certainly. The inspiration for that, first of all, came from my 93-year-old mother, whom I had tremendous respect. I determined some time ago, way before I wrote that essay, that age, a person's age, has a lot to do with the respect that they deserve. I look back now, I'm 72 years old now. I look back and I see I was wiser, I'm wiser now than I was at 62. I just know more about how the world works and how people work and relationships. I know more now than I did 10 years ago. And then I realized at 62, I was wiser than I was when I was 52. The same thing. I, I just knew more about how the world works and relationships and so on. And if you extrapolate from that, of course, um, every 10 years or so, 
I was growing wiser as I aged. Well, to go the other way around, of course, I look now at 72, and I expect and I hope I'll be here at 82, and I expect I'll be wiser at 82. Well, it made me appreciate and respect the 93 years that my mother had at the time I wrote that essay. I respected age tremendously and all that comes along with it. My mother was healthy and she was fine at the time. Mother's Day was coming up. And on, uh, I think it was Valentine's Day of that year, I wrote this essay to express that admiration that I had for her and my love for her. That's how that essay got written. I was encouraged by a, a literary agent friend of mine to submit that to NPR, and I did. And NPR came back to me and said they'd love if I could come to the studio and read it. I was more than happy to do so. So I recorded that that um, essay on air. I made a recording of that essay when it was uh, aired eventually. And I gave that recording to my mother on Mother's Day that year, 2005. And of course, she was thrilled. She cried a lot. And she was thrilled. I remember she played it for all of her friends, whoever was around and would listen. And then she died about a month and a half later. I was so lucky, fortunate to have that opportunity to have her go out knowing the love and respect that I had for her. It meant a lot to me. I know it meant a lot to her. What is the best thing about being Jerome Garfunkel? Uh, of course, the, the obvious answer is so many things. I have a sweet, wonderful daughter. That's another one of those things you learn in life. You go through all the trials and tribulations of children when they're young. You sweat like crazy during their adolescent years. You wonder if you're ever going to make it through their teenage years. It just gets to be so difficult. But I became a firm believer in something that I always pass on to, to others, including my brother, who also obviously went through teenage years with his first son. And that was after my experiences. And I used to tell him, hang in there. Just hang in there. You will see that after these, I'll call them awful years of adolescence, of rebellion, of um, striking out, after those years, there comes a period in our children's lives where they begin to change. They begin to settle down more. They lose their need to rebel and to punch back and to and to argue, it's at that point in your early 20, 20s, I used to tell people, that you'll hear your child for the first time maybe look at you and say, I love you. Thank you. Thank you for what you went through and, and thank you for hanging in there during those lives, during those years rather. And that's a wonderful thing to hear from your children. And in their 20s, they're still not finished bouncing around and being crazy. Gail Sheehy wrote a book called Passages many years ago, and I think she was writing primarily about women and girls growing up, but I found it absolutely equally true about men, boys and men as well. In your 20s, our children start to become, they're on their own now, very often. They are not living home. They are living elsewhere. They are bouncing off the walls. They are trying all kinds of experimental experimental things and and getting bruised and, and learning lessons from all of these bruises. If you can just keep them contained from not going too far off the wall, like getting into legal problems or health problems and so on. I used to tell people, if you put your hands around your child, you hug them, but you hug them as loosely as you possibly can. Give them as much room as possible to bounce off of the walls of your arms or the limits of what they must stay contained in. They'll do all the bouncing and they'll do all the learning. Hopefully, 
if your your hug is closed enough and strong enough, they won't go off the deep end. And then comes the next most exciting part of life, the late twenties, the early thirties, when our children become young adults. They've learned lots of lessons from those twenties. Sheehy, I think, said it's during these years in the early thirties that children or young adults are likely to become most entrepreneurial. If they ever have a time where they will have have the guts to go out and strike out on their own with what they've learned in their twenties and so on, this is when they will do it in their in their thirties. In my life, for sure, I was a living example of just that. So I knew my own personal experiences borne that out. One of the wonderful things about the World Wide Web, the Internet, is just our incredible ability to communicate with people. It's interesting when I hear from people all around the world, people that I would never have a chance to reach. So for anyone who's listening to this interview, what would you say to them, very open-ended, just to give you the stage? Well, taking up, picking up on just what you just said, one of the main advantages of the World Wide Web is that it is worldwide. I'm a very big believer in people learning empathy learning respect for other cultures, for other people, for other feelings. There is little better for teaching empathy or for learning empathy than there is seeing firsthand other people living other lives, lives that are not familiar with us, but are very familiar with them. And to not see those lives, these other lives, as funny or odd or difficult or strange, but simply different. And of course, to those people's lives, we look or appear to them exactly the same way. We seem odd, alien, perhaps there's something wrong with us. It is this notion of being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and view the world from somebody else's perspective that the World Wide Web is wonderful for, enhancing. It is giving us multicultural understanding all around the world about how the world works. This is a theme of mine that I have believed in for a long, long time as an educator. I've always believed that there are two very important subjects that are are missing in much of education. One is morals or ethics, and the other is empathy. These are two subjects that should be introduced to students beginning at age two or three, whatever, preschool. There should be dilemmas, challenges that are presented to children that challenge their their moral thinking, that challenge their empathetic thinking, to be able to think in somebody else's shoes and act accordingly. And it is very easy if, if school teachers and school curriculum writers were to um, ever want to do this, it is very easy to build these empathy or the empathetical challenges into their schoolwork, into the curriculum. I used to use a silly example of morals, I guess, and of empathy, of a person going through a a supermarket checkout and finding out that the cashier has accidentally given them an extra $20 bill in their change that was missed by mistake. They weren't supposed to get that. And now the moral dilemma comes, what do you do? Do you take that $20 bill and you and you give it back and you say here? Or do you very quietly get away with it because it's probably easy to have gotten away with it? There needs to be a lesson about what is good about giving that money back 
and what is bad about not giving that money back. This is a not a silly example, but it is an example that needs to be presented to children at every age. And of course, the examples be presented in an age appropriate way. It's not always going to be a cashier with an extra $20 bill. It can be blocks that children play with that, that for some reason, one child gets an advantage over another. And what does that child do? I think that this is something that's missing in the world today. The World Wide Web certainly provides the platform to change that. I'm not yet sure that it is being taken advantage of. Learning other cultures from connecting, one of my, my projects that I, I wrote about some time ago was connecting classrooms in in Brooklyn, New York, with a classroom in Bucharest, Romania, and having these students interact with each other. There needs to be a carefully developed curriculum for this interaction between the two classes. There are loads of logistical problems, of course, language differences, time zone differences. There are these kinds of logistics problems that needs to be need to be uh, worked out, but they're all workable, those problems. But it, it does give children and people a platform to see how others perceive the world. I think that's missing in education, and I strongly believe it should not be missing in education. And it comes up all the time. Empathy for me is one of the Perhaps empathy and kindness, two of the most important values that need to be explored and, and presented to children and adults at every chance that we have. Well spoken. Thank you very much for spending time with us. Paul, well, you're more than happy. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to talk to you. All right. Well, sir, I appreciate this a lot. Have a wonderful day. Maybe our paths will cross again. I hope so. And you too have a wonderful warm day from frigid Woodstock, which I think we're up to now three degrees. So you have a good day, Paul. And it's nice talking to you. Thank you very much. You too. Bye-bye.